have a Bible and you want to follow along, we're going to be in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17 again this evening, as we take a second look at John 17, it's like John 17, take two. We, uh, we went through John 17, just through it, and then I thought, you know, there's more here I want to, don't want to miss, that we want to talk about, and so we're, we come back and we've looked at a particular phrase that appears in John 17 no fewer than 10 times, and that phrase is, I have. Ten times in this chapter, Jesus praying to the Father tells the Father, I have done this, I have done this, I have done this. So we're looking at those ten. We've looked at six of the ten so far, one through six, and this time number seven and number eight. So number seven of the I haves is in verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have, I have sent them into the world. One more thing that Jesus has done, and he tells us not only what he's done, but he tells us why and what and and how and for what purpose and how it's how he's being done. I have sent them into the world. Well, if he has sent us into the world, how we would say how has he sent us? Well, it tells right there as the Father sent the Son. As, the, as you have sent me, Father, that's how I'm sending them. So the Son sends his people in the same way, or at least in ways that are similar to the way our Father sent the only begotten Son. Now, there's some obvious similarities, but there's also some dissimilarities in how he was sent and how he sends us. Uh, So I want to look at those, and we're going to begin with some dissimilarities. And I'm sure there's others. These are just the ones that have come to my mind. Dissimilarities, how how he was sent that we are not. Now you might... Some of you already may be thinking, oh, I I get where this is going, and you're already rushing ahead, and that's great. But if not, maybe you'll get it after I give you one or two. We are not sent from heaven to earth. He was. He was sent to leave the glory of heaven where he was in in perfect fellowship with the Father and with the Holy Spirit and, and surrounded by the angels worshiping him and doing his bidding. And he came from heaven to earth. That's not the way we're set. Some religions, Mormonism, for instance, teaches that human beings pre-existed before we were born. We were spirit somethings floating in outer neverland or something. And that when we come, when we're born, our pre-existent spirits get bodies. And I said, this, this is just fantasy. This is the Lord of nothing. It's, it's, not, it's just fairy tales. The whole religion is just fairy tales. They use a lot of the same words that we use as Christians, but they have all different meanings. And I don't say that to put the people down. I feel sorry for the people. They're deceived by a church that teaches patently false doctrine. If, if for no other way, the most egregious error is they say that as man now is, God once was, and as God now is, man may become. That is pure heresy. To say that God used to be a man like us, but he was so good at it, he became God. And if we're good enough at it, we'll become gods too. That is so far out of orbit with Christianity. I mean, it's fine if people want to believe that, but why do they call it Christian? So a dissimilarity is that we were not sent from heaven to earth. He was. Why are we not sent from heaven to earth? Uh, Let's see. Because he's God and we're not. Very, very clear, very clear. We are mere human beings. Here's another one. Dissimilarity comparing how the Father sent the Son and how the Son sends us. We were not sent in fulfillment of prophecy. Think of the Old Testament. How much of the Old Testament? Let me give you a tip. All of it. How much of the Old Testament is prophetic about Jesus? What did Jesus say? You search the scriptures for them, you think you have life, but these are they, the Old Testament scriptures, that testify of me. The whole Old Testament is about Jesus. It's not easy to see. It's it's much easier to see when you know Jesus and you go, oh, so that's what that was about. But there are 
hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament, literally hundreds of prophecies. And if we had eyes to see better, we maybe even would say thousands. I don't know. But there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that all point to Jesus. Not just things that are obvious prophecies that say he will be born in Bethlehem. No, but there's also everything in the, in the sacrificial system is a picture and is a type of what Jesus would accomplish when he came, but in a greater way. I've got news for you. There are no prophecies in the Old Testament that are about you or about me. Because <laughs> it's a good, they call it the good book, so we're not in it. <laughs> uh, we weren't sent in fulfillment of prophecy, but Jesus definitely was. He was sent to fulfill prophecies. Here's the third one. We were not sent to perform miracles. He was sent, and he performed miracles. Why did he perform miracles? He performed miracles, I believe, the greatest reason he came to perform miracles was because he, was, he came and he was moved with compassion. See, he came to address sin by dying on the cross and rising again from the dead. But when he came here, he saw, as a human would see, not that it was anything he didn't already know because he already knows everything because he just happens to be God. But when he came here and he was walking around as a, as a human being, a real human being, and seeing the ravages of what sin has done to destroy people's lives, he saw those people and he was moved with compassion. But he was sent to do that. So he was sent to perform miracles. We're not. We're not. You know, we pray for the sick and we pray for a lot of things and we ask God because you do not have because you do not ask. But we don't have power or authority. No one does. When someone says, well, I'm a healer. No, you're not a healer. God is a healer. He may answer your prayers. That's wonderful when he does. But you and I and nobody, we have no powers of healing. Jesus was sent to heal people, he even raise the dead. And here's the, here's the cherry on the top of the pile of whipped cream on this thing. We weren't sent to save anybody. Jesus was sent expressly more than anything else for this cause. He came to save his people from their sins. That's what he came for. We didn't come to do that. We can't even save ourselves. If we could, we wouldn't need a Savior. But we can't save ourselves. That's why we need a Savior. But we definitely aren't or weren't sent to save people. Jesus was. There's some dissimilarities. And I'm sure if we really wanted to rack, rack our brains, we could come up with others. But here's some similarities. Now I say not exact, but similarities. Jesus was sent to preach. Jesus said, for this reason I have come, to preach the gospel. I think it's Mark chapter 1 or Mark chapter 2. He came to preach. And of course, the gospel he preached was the gospel about himself. So there's a similarity, but there's also a little bit of a dissimilarity. Jesus was sent to preach. We are sent to proclaim Jesus. We are sent to proclaim Christ and the gospel, and the word of God. It's interesting, he was sent to preach, and as the ultimate preacher, as the savior, he came to save his people. We're not coming to save any people, but we are sent, and we, we, we are sent to point people to him as the savior. He came to say, here I am. We come to say, look at him. That's how, that's how we preach. We say, look to Christ. Look to Christ. Jesus wasn't sent to judge. Think about it. Think John chapter 3. He did not come to judge. He will, the second time, his judgment will be final when he comes again. But he didn't come to judge. He came to save. He didn't come to judge. He came to reconcile. And I would say that we need to judge less and seek to reconcile more if we would be like him. Does that make sense? To judge less and seek to reconcile more. As his ministry of preaching, he was sent to serve, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Those are his words, the Son of Man. He speaks of himself. 
I came, he's telling his disciples, to serve and, to, and ultimately, not to just do something nice for somebody, but to ultimately to serve and to give my own life as a ransom for yours, for many people. Similarities, believers are sent to serve. There's only two places in the Bible where Jesus is expressly said to be an example to us. Now, he is an example to us in many ways. But it is interesting. There are two places in the Bible where it says Jesus was, is, is our example. Okay? One is he is an example of service. In the upper room, he washed their feet. And you remember what he said? You don't understand what I'm doing. Someday you will understand, but I came to set an example for you. You are to serve one another, even as I humbled myself and washed your feet this night. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. The other place is in 1 Peter, where Peter says Jesus came as an example. The word is used. He came as an example, not just to serve, but to suffer and in particularly to suffer persecution unjustly. First Peter tells, tells us that. He was sent to serve, and as believers, we are sent to serve. Jesus was not received. Here's a similarity. Jesus was not received by most to whom he came. Oh, they liked the free lunch program. They were happy. You know, I always, always like to remember this. I don't always say it, but I always like to remember in, in that day and age, there was no such thing as medicine. They just tried to put some oil and make you comfortable, and hopefully you got better. And if not, you died. Jesus came along, and he healed people. He, he came along, and he was able to do things that were, that were... They liked the healings. They clamored for that. They clamored for when he was going to feed the multitudes. They clamored to see what he could do and to see those kinds of things. But his message was rejected more often than it was received. And then ultimately, of course, he paid that price because they wanted to kill him. I'll say it tonight and I'll say it again Sunday. People wanted to kill him, but nobody did. Nobody could. And he specifically said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. They wanted to kill him. They set out to kill him. They thought they killed him. Remember, that's why they put the the guards and the, the stone in front of the tomb and then the guards and the seal on there because we're afraid someone will steal his body and say that we didn't succeed in killing him. They didn't kill him anyway. He laid down his life so he could take it up. Well, here's again a similarity. Jesus was not received by most. Instead, he re- experienced persecution. He says, it says of him in John chapter 1, he came to his own, but his own what? did not receive him. But to as many as do receive him, he gives the power to become the sons of God. But most people didn't receive him. Guess what? There's a similarity for us too. We're sent to preach the gospel. And if we're faithfully preaching the gospel, we will not be received by most either. We can't let that trouble us. What we need to do is we need to tell the truth and then let God sort it out. He will save his people. The father sent the son to do some certain things. We've talked about a few of them just now. Guess what he did when, on the mission for which he was sent? All of it. All of it. I love in John chapter 4 when Jesus, the, the disciples said, we're going to go get some food. And they were gone for a while, you remember? And he was talking to the woman at the well. And then they came back and, and he, he, didn't, he wasn't interested in eating. And they go, what's the matter? Maybe, maybe he had some food we didn't know about it. He goes, no, my meat, what nourishes me and keeps me going is doing the will of my father. He was sent on a mission from the father, and the thing that kept him going was doing the will of his father. He was sent by the father in many of the ways we've just talked about, and he accomplished every single one of them. He was obedient. He was obedient. Does anybody here ever get a a little list of things to do. Maybe you make your own list. I make lists and put little boxes next to them so I can check them off. It makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something. That's why I make lots of things, things that I'm going to do without thinking because I can say, man, I did all of this stuff today. <laughs> Breathe, yes. <laughs> Blink eyes frequently, yes. But he was sent by his father, and when he was done, he says in this, in this book, in this uh, particularly in this chapter, I finished the work you sent me to do. I finished the task. Why do I bring that up? Well, the Son has sent us to do some things too. 
what are we supposed to do? Whatever's on the list. Whatever's on the list. The, the Son did what the Father sent him to do, and the Son has sent us, and we must do what he has sent us to do. When we have no heart, and this is where it comes, this is really where the rubber meets the road on this kind of thing. It's not just about doing religious things and checking religious boxes. I mean, that's easy. Religion, pe- religious people do that. that. So what? It's about the heart. Do Jesus' heart was, was in sync with his Father's heart. He wanted to do what the Father told him to do. I ask myself, and I ask you to ask yourself, do I have a heart to do what Christ has sent me for? Do I have a heart to do the things for which I have been sent? You know, I would say if we have no heart, not just if we don't have any activity, but if we have no heart, for instance, for the lost to be saved, if we have no heart for people to hear the message of Christ and be born again, what people? Our family members who don't know Christ, our friends, our neighbors, people we work with, people we know, whether it's across the street or it's the other side of the world. Do we have a heart for people to hear the gospel? And do we realize we've been sent to make him known? And of course, we don't have time to get into it, but of course, we do that in a variety of different ways. People that we know, we talk to. People on the other side of the world, we support missionaries. These are all ways that we're seeking to do what the Father sent us to do. I just want to share one other thing on this business of being sent. The Father has authority. Would you, would you agree with that? God the Father has authority. He doesn't need anybody to countersign his checks. You know, he doesn't need to get permission for anybody. He doesn't need to have any of his decisions ratified. He's just, he's God. The Father, with authority, sent Jesus, and Jesus did what the Father sent him to do. Jesus, with authority, sent us. I trust that you're familiar with what we call the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. All authority. Well, that pretty much covers everything, but just in case anybody found a loophole, all authority in heaven and earth, that pretty much covers everything because there's really only two realms, in heaven and earth. He's got all authority, and he says go. And just as the Father authoritatively told the Son to come and do what the Son did, we are to, do, to, to bend to the authority of our Lord who has all authority. So, I have, he says. Here's one of these recurring phrases in John chapter 17. I have sent them into the world. How? Even as the Father sent the Son. Here's the eighth one. It's in verse 22. And the glory which you gave me. Now again, who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking to? His Father in heaven. He's praying. And the, and the glory which you, Father, gave me, the Son, I, the Son, have given them. Who's them? The disciples. I have given them. For what purpose? That they may be one just as we are one. So here's an I have. He says, I've given them glory. I think it's interesting that uh, it's the same sort of idea. The, the glory, is he, we were, he sent us the way the Father sent him, and he has given us glory the way the Father gave him glory. There's these parallels here. I have given them glory. What is meant by the glory which you gave me, I have given them? As many of you know, one of my favorite writers and Bible commentators and preachers is Bishop J.C. Ryle. J.C. Ryle lived in the 19th century. That's the 1800s. He was the Bishop of Liverpool even long ago, even before the Beatles in Liverpool. Um, He wrote this about this verse 22. I thought, this is great. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm getting a bunch of this from him because that's how good it is. He says, this is a very difficult expression and one that seems to puzzle all commentators. The whole question is, what did our Lord mean by the glory which he gave? And then Ryle, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, he lists seven different opinions about what's meant by this. 
Well, I'm going to tell you what those seven different opinions are. I'm going to tell you some names, not to dazzle you with names, but just to show you that these opinions aren't opinions that somebody found in the dumpster someplace. These are like heavy hitters in church history. We start with one of the heaviest, John Calvin. John Calvin said, glory, and I'm not quoting, I'm just paraphrasing, glory is the image and likeness of God, not the original image that Adam and Eve had, but the renew, and then was damaged because of sin, but the renewed image in Christians when we're born again. That's what Calvin said he thought Jesus was referring to. Here's another one. This name probably won't mean much to anybody of of us. His name was Bengal. He's not a tiger. Bengal is his name. He was a Lutheran um, theologian. He said the glory is the power and influence and authority which Jesus had and then was given to the apostles. So in this view, this verse 2 is really speaking just to the apostles. Here's another view. A Swiss theologian, one of the three major heavy hitters of the Reformation, Ulrich Zwingli, he said the glory is the power of working miracles. And again, that would be for the apostles because Christ came to perform miracles, the apostles did, and for the most part, for the most part, uh, miracles are not something that Christians do. We pray for them, and maybe God does them, and maybe He doesn't, but we don't perform miracles. Here's a fourth one. St. Augustine, not the guy in the third row, but uh, St. Augustine, um, and later a man named uh, Heinrich Bollinger, I'll tell you about him in a few moments, uh, St. Augustine said this glory is the heavenly immortality which our Lord promised to all Christians. We're going to be glorified. That's what he said it was. Here's a Roman Catholic theologian. His name was Toltus. He said the glory is what is what we receive when we receive the Lord's Supper. And I don't want to be snide about this, but one thing you can always count on Roman Catholic theologians, they'll always point back to the sacraments because they think that's where you get saved. So he thought this glory must have something to do with the Lord's Supper. Here's one which I read about from another person you hear me quote from from time to time, A.W. Pink. A.W. Pink was a very end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. A.W. Pink said, The glory is the unity of mind and heart that Christians have like the unity of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the last one is written by, it comes from a guy named Martin Bootser. It's spelled B-U-C-E-R, but it's Swiss, so it's Bootser. He said, The glory is the glory of the Holy Spirit. Interesting idea. The glory of the Holy Spirit, who, as Bullinger, excuse me, not Bullinger, this is Bootser, as Bootser said, he quoted from 1 Peter 4.14, where Peter calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of glory. Well, there's seven ideas, and, they, and they're not bad ideas. They're all potentially correct ideas. Ryle goes on and after naming these seven opinions, um, And he writes this, the question will probably never be settled by us. And then he proceeded to say which of the seven he liked and he held to. Well, now I'm going to give you my favorite of the seven, except for there's four of them. Because I think four of those seven are really good. And I'm putting them in order that makes sense to me. So smile and humor me like it makes sense to you too. The first one of those which can explain what, again, let's not forget what we're getting. This This isn't some abstract thing. We're getting this because Jesus said, the glory which you gave me, I have given them. What does that mean? The one that I'll start with comes from John Calvin. Of course, I like John Calvin's ideas about almost everything. He, his idea was that Jesus has given us the glory of renewed humanity. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but it's something to think about. When we were born again, something changed in our nature. You realize that? Something changed in our nature. Well, let's go back to our nature as created. Not our nature as we were born, but our nature as human beings were created. What what did God say in in the first chapter of Genesis? Let us create man in our image and according to our likeness. And he created Adam and Eve. 
Adam and Eve sinned. We don't know how much longer after creation, but we can guess it was probably moments. I'm just kidding, but it probably didn't take long for human beings to sin. And what happened to that nature? Now, some people argue that the, na the nature of God in human beings was devastated and destroyed by sin. Not so. It's marred, but it's not destroyed. You see the difference between something that's marred, something that's maybe warped a little bit? You know, you get a mirror that's got a warp in it, and you look at it, and you kind of, woo, woo, but it's still, it's still there. And that's kind of the image of God in us. It's marred, but not destroyed. Human beings are still, even fallen human beings that don't believe in Christ have not been born again. Human beings are still different from all other created beings. You know, it just amazes me, and I don't say this to be snide or to be mean or to be cheeky, but just, it's just think. You know, when people say there's no difference between animals and human beings, have you ever met an animal that, that uh, wrote a symphony or operated on a, you know, do you ever see a dog operate on a fellow dog to cure them or something? There's a difference. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. We watched a, a movie recently where someone had lost a loved one. It was just a movie. It was fiction, but someone had lost a loved one, actually two loved ones. And this the camera was just on this human face. Great actor. I won't go into who it is or what the context was, but it just is an illustration. This guy's face, as he broke down and cried for, quite, for several minutes, was powerful. He lost people he loved. I looked over to Francis and I said, have you ever seen an animal weeping like that over a, an animal that's dead? And not to be coarse or anything like that. She goes, no. Francis says, no, but I have seen him eventually eat that animal. We're not animals. We're human beings created in the image of God. Now, that image got messed with because of sin. We're all tainted. We're born in sin. We still, we still bear the image, but the image has been marred. But here is the... Here's the, the theological truth of this. When we're born again, the marred image is restored. The marred image of God is restored. At least in, now follow me, you got to stay awake and alive on this, at least in our position, remember that word, at least in our position, even if not completely in our condition. Now, let me explain what those are. Our position in Christ is established when we are justified. When we are justified as believers in Jesus Christ, God declares believers to be righteous and holy as Jesus is righteous and holy. And in God's eyes, we are. And that position can't, not only will never, it can never change. It's done. When we're justified through faith in Christ, we are positionally robed in His righteousness. Our position cannot change. But then I mentioned condition. What's the difference between position and condition? Our condition is how we live while we're still in this fallen world. We're still in these bodies and these minds that are still corrupted by vestiges of sin that remain in us. Our condition once we're born again, our condition, hopefully, it's supposed to be changing as we grow in grace, as we grow in our, our understanding, our knowledge, and our appreciation of Christ in the gospel. And then we are progressively transformed, as the Bible says, into the, from glory to glory, into the, from glory to glory, no less, to the image and likeness of Christ. That's how condition works. Our condition should be constantly changing as we're maturing. So here's where, here's where we are. We're, we're born again, and we believe, and we're justified, declared righteous, but we're still not completely righteous, and we start on this trajectory of growing in grace. This sanctification, we'll come back to that later. Here's a second opinion, which I really like. This is Martin Bootser. Martin Bootser was a contemporary of Luther. 
early 1500s. He was a, a Roman Catholic priest, and he made the wonderful discovery to read Martin Luther's writings, and he said, what have we been thinking? <laughs> and he, he became a, a, an important man in the uh, Reformation. The, and here's what he says, the fact that as believers, I'm not quoting, the fact, the fact that as believers we are all filled with the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is glorious. Is it not? This is what Paul argues in the first chapter of Ephesians. He goes, I pray for you. And then he gives him like five different prayer requests. This is in chapter one of Ephesians, towards the end. And one of those things that he prays, that you would know, that you would understand the power of God that is in you. And then he says, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you if you're a Christian. That's glorious. And why don't, we, why don't we live that way more? Because we don't realize, we tend to forget. We either don't know or we tend to forget. We don't maybe appreciate that the power of God that raised Christ from the dead is in us. And as Ryle, J.C. Ryle reminds us, Peter in 1 Peter 4, 14, called the Holy Spirit the Spirit of glory. So we're born again, and our nature changes, and that's glorious. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's glorious. How did the Father give that glory to Jesus? We know that glory has been given to us because the Bible tells us we're filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Well, what about Jesus? Isn't he God? He's always been God. Yes, he's God, and he's always been God. But is there something we can look to and say this is when the Father gave this glorious gift of the Holy Spirit, even to Jesus? Yes. Yes, indeed. At his baptism. At Jesus' baptism. I'm not going to ask you to turn to it and go all through it, but if you are familiar with it, and if you know this, and if not, read it sometime. At his baptism, all three members of the Trinity were present. Jesus was there because he was being baptized. The Holy Spirit was there as he descended like a dove and alighted on his head. And the Father was there doing what? Speaking out of heaven. A voice, an audible voice of God came from heaven. What must that have sounded like? You know, we read this stuff and it's in the Bible and it's true, but I mean, think about that. They heard a voice come out of heaven and it was the Father speaking. And what did he say? He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit came on him at that time. The Holy Spirit the fa was given by the Father to the God-man. And, and, that's, and that's glorious. That's a good, a good thing, a good way to understand. The glory which you gave me, I have given them. As the Father gave me the Holy Spirit, I give you the Holy Spirit. Does that sound like a good thing? I hope you'd agree that it is. Here's a third opinion. Now, I said a moment ago, this is an opinion that comes from A.W. Pink. Actually, that's not true. A.W. Pink expanded on it and wrote about it quite a bit. But before Pink, two German Protestant theologians, a guy named Steyer and a guy named Hengstenberg. By the way, just an inside thing. Don't, don't pick on me for saying this because it's true. Okay, More bad theology for Christians has come out of Germany than almost any place else historically. It's just, just, you know, this, like Luther, he's good. But in the modern era, uh, li liberalism, which is still wreaking havoc in the church, came primarily from, from Germany. But these guys were good. And they said, the glory Jesus has given us is the unity of believers that believers enjoy that is like the unity of of the Father and the Son. Now, if you know anything about John chapter 17, the unity of the Father and the Son and the unity of Christians together with one another is a major theme of this. If I hadn't, if I didn't know of any of these other opinions, I would come to this conclusion myself just based on the text. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? 
Well, if you look at, look at your Bible, begin reading in verse 20, John chapter 17. Look at the context of verse 22, beginning in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, meaning the men who were just here. By the way, what does that say? What does that say? These prayers are not exclusively for the apostles. They're for the apostles and all who would ever come to faith because of the work of the apostles, the ministry. I do not pray for these alone, but also those who will believe in me through their word. Here's what he prays. Verse 20, that they may be one. He's praying for unity of his people. How, how united are we to be? Verse 21, that they may be one as you, Jesus says to his father, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also may be one in us. For what end? That the world may believe that you sent me. Now, verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one. There's the context. It's all about, it's all, I, th I believe this is contextually the best answer. The glory is the glory, the glory of the unity of Christians that is mimicking the unity of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I got news for you. That's glorious. Since unity is what Jesus was talking about, it makes sense that that's what he was talking about. And I would say, is it not glorious that Christians think about, I mean, even just in this room not right now, there's not a lot of us here, but just in this room right now, and if it's true here, it's true. The more Christians you get together or the more there are in the world, it's true. Isn't it fascinating that Christians who otherwise may have nothing in common, when our faith is in Christ, we have the most important thing of all time in common, faith in Christ. I remember early on we had a, uh, a man in our church who was so dear. I, I, I miss him terribly. He was so dear. He was such a godly man and such an influential man even in my life even. And I don't know if he laughed. I'll say we laughed. I know I did. We were about the same age. He might have been a year older. And I said, you know, if we, if we got in the time machine and went back to high school, we wouldn't have anything to do with each other. We wouldn't have anything to do with each other. And, and look at us. Because we both love Jesus Christ, we love each other. It's, it's, it's uncanny. It's more than two guys liking the same sports team. It's more than two women both liking to tat. It's, it's more than anything else that we would have in common. Because it crosses nationalities, it crosses, we can, be, we can be completely different in every other way, but when we're in Christ, we are one. And friends, that is glorious. We're united in Christ. We're, we have faith in Christ together. We have, we're children of God together. We're brothers, that's why we call each other brother and sister. And, and I got news for you, as much as we love our biological families, I mean, some of us do, right? I hope. You know what they say about family. Family are people you love. If you weren't related to, you wouldn't like. <laughs> but we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's not going to end. It goes beyond the fact of, of having things in common. It, it is having Christ in common. And then what about the commonality, the unity we have as Christians after this life? Well, that brings up number four. As mentioned, Augustine and later Heinrich Bullinger, who was also a, an important person in the Reformation, Augustine put forth the Augustine's hundreds of years before the Reformation. Augustine put forth the opinion that the ultimate glory of Christ has given to every one of his people is the glory of heavenly immortality. What's the ultimate problem you and I have? Not spiritual, but physical beings. Dying. But in Christ, that's been addressed. We're going to go to heaven, and we're going to live forever with God and with our brothers and sisters united. And I would say that's glory. 
We mentioned just a moment ago, I'm just going to bring this full circle and we'll be done. We mentioned earlier that when we're justified, God declares us to be holy and righteous just as Jesus is holy and righteous. That's how he sees us, even though we're not there yet, conditionally. This position in Christ cannot change, which I say hallelujah. Though conditionally we still wrestle with sin in this life, listen, sanctification is the process in which our condition every day, hopefully, is looking a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more like our position. We start off as rank sinners declared holy, and then we grow in holiness a little, a little, a little, hopefully never stopping. In this life, our condition and our position will not be identical. We're never in this life going to reach a place where we are living and breathing and acting and thinking and speaking as righteously and holy as, as Jesus. Would you agree with that? It's not going to happen. But when we die or when Christ comes again, we shall be what? Glorified. Which is what St. Augustine said, the glory that you gave me is eternal life that he has given us. We actually, we shall actually be, not just declared to be, but we shall actually be without sin. And even without the ability to sin forever. Now, some people might say, well, that's probably not going to be very much fun. You've got a lot more sanctification you need. <laughs> you need to learn that sin is not fun. We all need to learn that sin is not fun. It's destructive. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but then it kills us, destroys us, ruins us. But we will be in heaven. Why is it that there are no more tears, no more sorrow in heaven? I'll tell you why. Not because we don't care. We're not just all medicated. You know, you medicate people enough, they don't care about anything. Well, that must be like heaven. No. The reason why there's no more tears and no more sorrow is because there's no more sin. There's just Christ. The beauty of Christ. Romans 8:18. 8, the Apostle Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this life, in which we strive and struggle and have problems. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Not that may be, but that shall be. That shall be revealed in us. Jesus Praying to the Father in verse 22 said, The glory which you, Father, have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. These I haves open up some pretty deep wells to think and meditate on theologically. And I hope that you have been stimulated and stirred and maybe encouraged by some of this tonight. Father, thank you for your great kindness to us. Thank you that you not only sent us, Lord Jesus, you sent us as the Father sent you, but you've empowered us to be able to do what you sent us to do. And we thank you, Father and Son, that the, the glory that was given by the Father to the Son has been given to us. And as we've just discovered, there's a lot of different ideas of what that may be referring to. But one thing's for sure. We don't know glory apart from Christ. And in Christ, our future is eternity in glory. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope this gave you some things to think about. And I hope that it's encouraging. Jesus, Jesus accomplished all these things for those he came to save. And if you're one of them, he's done them. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.